thank you to those of you who are in person. Thank you to those of you who are joining us from Zoom. Uh, my name is Clay Carey. I'm the Vice President of Programs for Alabama Media Professionals. Uh, we're excited to have this event here in Tuscaloosa. This is our first uh, first shot at a Tuscaloosa event. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, the event today is focused on networking and mentorship. I'm going to talk really briefly about Alabama Media Professionals uh, before we dive in. Uh, AMP is the state chapter of the National Federation of Press Women, uh, but it's not just for people who work in the press, and it's not just for women. Uh, many of us, myself, Stephen, Solomon, other famous <laughs> gentlemen, are uh, actively involved in AMP. Uh, it's a great space for people who want to learn more about all types of communication careers, whether it's journalism, public relations, advertising, film, creative media, media freelance. Uh, we have folks in all those spaces. Um, we meet once a month. Uh, those meetings uh, historically have been in Homewood, but we're trying to get out to other parts of the state. Uh, and we always are, are streaming on Zoom. So uh, even if you're not uh, somebody who can be in Birmingham consistently, uh, there's always a space for you. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about AMP, grab one of us, myself or Solomon, be glad to tell you uh, more about it. Uh, there's also a QR code that you can scan in the back of the phone uh, that will give you some information about that as well. Uh, so we'll dive right into our first workshop, which is called Getting the Most Out of Networking Opportunities. Uh, we have two really interesting folks who are going to talk to us a little bit about approaches to networking. And then uh, our vision for both of these sessions is that they be very interactive. So there'll be time for questions and answers uh, and group discussion uh, in the second half. Uh, first, Stephen, Stephen Deathridge. Stephen, come on up, grab a seat. Richard, you can come on up, too. Uh, Stephen's a lifelong Alabama resident. He spent 12 years reporting for various media outlets in the Tuscaloosa area, including stats at the Crimson White, Birmingham News, AL.com, and the Tuscaloosa News, and more. Uh, before joining the team at Town Square Media, where he now serves as editor in chief of the Tuscaloosa Thread, which is an online uh, news outlet uh, that uh, is operated by Town Square Media. Uh, our other panelist for this session is Richard Rush. Richard became director of communications for the city of Tuscaloosa in 2019. He has more than 15 years of experience in marketing, advertising, and public relations. Prior to joining the city, Richard taught advertising to me at Sanford University. So thank you both for being here. I've asked Stephen and Richard both to talk just for a couple of minutes about how they approach networking and give us some, some big picture thoughts about networking, and then we can dive into some questions. So, uh, uh, Richard, you want to get us started? Yeah, sure, absolutely. You stand, you sit. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm better. <laughs> um, okay, so just I think a few thoughts about networking. Um, you know, it has made a difference in every stage of my life, really. Um, networking has always been something that I think when I was a you know student, um, young professional, you keep hearing you need to network, you need to network. And okay, what does that mean? Okay, go stand in a room with professionals and stand awkwardly and I don't know what to say and I don't know how many people here. And sometimes you just have to go up and just hey, this is who I am and this is what I want to do. And one thing that I have found is that I haven't found one professional who is further along in their career than I am, does not want to help, but they don't know how to help it if they don't know who you are and you don't ask. And so I think that for me, um, one of the things that has really made a difference is coming to the conclusion that people want to help you. The average person out there would love to do whatever they could, connect you with whoever they have a connection with. So that's one of my... Um, the things that really gives me the greatest amount of joy. I love um, meeting people and making connections. Hey, you should meet so-and-so. I think that y'all can really collaborate well together. And um, a lot of people feel the same way. So I think that just having the mindset that um, not just what can I get out of networking, but I might be able to help this person also. And you never know, we might be able to work together. So um, I think really just kind of the mindset behind it opens it up um, to... Uh, being successful, so and it's really helped me along. So. I, I like that we're up here, that I'm up here with Richard, uh, because we're coming at networking and media from two different sides of the coin. Sure. Uh, I'm in journalism and Richard's in PR, and Richard is one of the people further along in his career who's willing to help me further. I remember when uh, I don't think we launched 
read when Richard was first hired in the city. Was that pre August 2020? That's right. Yeah. So the, the site did not yet lie, and then I was just managing the radio website for Townsville Media locally for uh, a local uh, FM radio station. And uh, Richard and my boss and a couple other people from my company, the, his hire was announced, went to Billy's in Northport. We sat down and had a meal and got to know each other. And that's good because I probably call Richard once a week at least yes. with uh, with questions about coverage. We were talking or vice versa. Or vice versa. We were talking yesterday about road work on Jack Moore Parkway, about the city's collaboration with the University of Alabama on uh, alcohol sales and more, because he's a point person in the city and I cover the city. In in journalism, I think you know you, you all need to be sort of thinking about networking in two ways especially at this stage in your career. There's the networking you need to do to get your job, which is what you guys need to be spending almost all of your attention on right now. And then the networking that you need to excel at your job. And you can start that now, but it will come in handy later. On the first side, when I was a student at the University of Alabama, I was, I was still pretty introverted. I was still trying to figure out what... Uh, uh, how, how to just get ahead, how to succeed, battling millennial imposter syndrome. And, and I, I wasn't sure where to begin, except I built really good relationships with people on campus. Uh, Mark Mayfield, who some of you may know, was the uh, faculty advisor of the Crimson White. He's now the internship coordinator for the uh, journalism school, for the, the College of Communication and Information Sciences. I sort of class with Rick Bragg and uh, was able to add him to my list of references. Uh, Chris Roberts, who knows every media professional in maybe the United States, taught me ethics and remained a, uh, a, a close ally to me in undergrad and then after graduation. And so in 2013, when I graduated, uh, I was on spring break that April when Mark Mayfield called me and asked if I would be interested in staying in Tuscaloosa and working for AL.com, covering uh, public safety and, and government. And... Um, I, I was hired before I graduated, before I had a degree, because Mark knew that an opening was coming up in Tuscaloosa, and he, he fit me in that slot. And my portfolio, my time at CW, and other references helped me get the rest of the way, but it was Mark who called me and said, I have a position that may interest you if you're willing to stay in West Alabama. I was at AL.com for three years, and I was laid off, and it was Chris Roberts who told me that the Tuscaloosa News was hiring a uh, general assignment. I was there for three years before I ended up at town school. And then after you, uh, after you have leveraged networking on campus, you've got to start networking, especially if you're going into the journalism side and reporting side. Your network has to be deep and wide and, and uh, grow all the time. Uh, your professors, I'm sure, have told everyone that uh, journalism is a, a field that's getting smaller. Everyone's being asked to do more with less. That is uh, absolutely true. Uh, the thread is a, a major player in local media, but I'm a senator, I'm its only reporter, I'm its only photographer, I'm doing most of that work alone. And so I, I have to have a network that is as big as Tuscaloosa County. In crime alone, we have the Tuscaloosa Police Department, the Norfolk Police Department, the Tuscaloosa County Sheriff's Office, the University of Alabama Police Department. Each of those has a chief, uh, and each uh, has a public information officer, a different person. So with the, the city, I need to know Brent Blankley, the chief, Stephanie Taylor, the public information officer. I need to know Richard, who can tell me everything else that's happening at the city. Uh, I, there are animal control officers. When there's a horse on the loose or a kangaroo sighting, there are specific human trafficking officers, traffic fatality PIOs. There are people who are only concerned with narcotics and drugs. Uh, FBI, the, the SBI, the, the, the it's huge, it's huge, yeah. and that's, that's one key, that's public safety alone, and I have every one of those persons, I have every one of their cell phone numbers and email addresses, they know who I am, I know who they are, and they trust me enough that when I call them, they will answer and tell me what's going on, and that has really only come after 13 years of building that network. And it's you have to have it in public safety. I could name, I could rattle off a similar list for restaurant, retail, and industrial development, the business side of things. Uh, in education, you have the city school system, the county school system, the University of Alabama, Stillman College, Shelton State. Every one of those has their own people to network. And to do journalism, to be a good media professional, 
it is your happy task to learn all of those people and to network with all those people and to do so in a way that uh, they are willing to help you and they seek you when they need help. And so if you, if you can just uh, chip away at it for a decade, you can, uh, you can really you know, uh, build your network into something that will work for you constantly and allow you to work for others. So that when someone like Richard has something that they want their audience to know, they are thinking, let me call Stephen. Let me call the thread. I will reach out to him first. And it eliminates kind of that groundwork. I play a lot less catch up than I used to because my network will reach out to me. And uh, that's what you've got to establish. After you establish the network that's going to get you the job, you have to build the network that's going to help you with sell it. That may have been more than six no. months. Oh, <laughs> Steve, you mentioned uh, sort of the beginning of your talk, you described yourself as an introvert. Uh, was it difficult to sort of get past that and to get comfortable approaching people, uh, particularly you know, when it comes to networking or just journalism generally, did, was that a struggle? I still will, if I can, at a networking event, my first temptation is still to Irish goodbye. And just, you know, as soon as kind of <laughs> everything that is like on the agenda is over, to just sort of fade away and leave. Because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a 30 something, you know, nervous imposter syndrome millennial who doesn't feel like I belong in the room, who doesn't feel like that, uh, that I, I belong in those conversations. But I do. And everybody does. Everybody in the profession does. And so it was hard to overcome. As, as a, before I got to the university, I, I struggled to ask for a refill at a, at a sit down restaurant. Um, and, and to overcome that, to sit up here today and just talk to a small group of people is miles further than I ever thought I'd get. But the profession demands, you know, a, a, a reporter without a network, a reporter who can't talk to people is not going to do a lot of very good work unless you're in an extremely niche kind of investigative, data-driven role. You've got to be able to talk to people. And it is, uh, it's the skill that will benefit you most in journalism. It's the skill that will translate best in PR and other communications devices or other communication roles. Um, it, it, it's just networking. It's the ability to talk to people, the ability to get information from them and share information with them and then spit that back out to your audience. But, you know, it's funny. I don't think that Steven's giving himself credit. I've seen him, I've seen him work for him. So, so, so he's at least gotten pretty comfortable at it. So. Uh, well, then it helps, you know, to when, when the reputation of your brand precedes you. Or something I ran into with the thread for our first year, we only launched three years ago. And so I would tell someone, no, I'm Stephen Depp, I'm the editor of the thread, and they go, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think after three years, we're mostly past those days. Generally, when I'm in a room with professionals and politicians and educators and law enforcement, they are readers. They, they know who, what the brand is and what our mission is, and it is easier to connect with them now than it was to, even just a few years ago. But uh, you, 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 you want to have... Uh, uh, a Rolodex or a cell phone or an Outlook uh, contact list that is just embarrassingly long. Uh, a, a beat sheet is uh, how it was described to me in, uh, in, in college at the university to develop this, this multi-page. I had 10 or 11 pages in Google Docs. It's just names, positions, and cell phones. And uh, it allows me, if anything happens at any time, to take up the phone and figure out what's going on and relay that to my audience as fast, if not faster than anybody else in the world. Have any questions from the room? Okay. Yeah, what you got? Um, so I know you discussed recently how you have different sides of the coin of the industry, like PR, advertising, also professor background versus working independently and connecting with people and then trying networking and use the sources. Can you talk a bit about networking with people that are still working in the journalism industry, but across the aisle, like with each other at events or like that? Sure. Talking. PR agents, PR companies, journalists. Sure. Uh, no, absolutely. And I'm sorry. I'll start, I'll start off. Um, so Stephen and I, it's funny because we were talking about another event this afternoon that I'll be at. And I'm sure that I'll be We were together yesterday. Yeah. Yes. And so we end up at the same events all the time. I mean, multiple times a week. And um, a lot of times he's, you know, like, it's funny because like he is the face that I know and so I'll walk into a room and I'll see Stephen and then automatically that's kind of like where I go to talk first and then we go okay so like we talked and now we're going to like talk to other people but a lot of times I see him before I see anybody else and so um but man it is so important to have that relationship um where it's not every time that he calls 
it is there's a crisis going on, and I'm I'm, I'm trying to put out something that is worded perfectly, and he's trying to figure out things. Like, okay, I'm trying to report what happened. Just give me the details, and it's good to know each other outside of that environment. So I, I think it's been very valuable for me to even when I started in this market, reaching out to other people in all of the different areas of journalism across the city and going, hey, we need to grab lunch, you want to grab a drink later, whatever, so that we are getting to know each other before I need you and you need me. And so I think that was one of the things that in any any industry job that I've had that, that, like, that I've really tried to do. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, maintaining just the, the amicability <laughs> of a relationship across the aisle is extremely important. Um, as a, um, you know, uh, uh, my own editor without a whole lot of oversight and who has enough knowledge and experience in Tuscaloosa to write about it um, intelligently, uh, I would say that the city and I have not always had, uh, our, our views have not always aligned. You know, with the city council, with the mayor, their elected officials, I try not to let any of my own uh, biases and thoughts into the publication. But I certainly have, and I have certainly covered things that elected officials and, and law enforcement uh, officers and others across the board in any meeting probably would not like, would not have liked to see public stars. But, but, but Richard and I maintain that relationship, and and so it has to be with everybody on the on the other side of the aisle because I'm going to work with them again. Mm -hmm. Outside of the top 100 biggest markets in the U.S., I mean, you're going to be working with the same people in the same roles. And uh, you need to have a good relationship with them, um, so that when you call the answer, or you're they or they're going to be answering other calls for you, they're going to be talking to their to your competitors, and you're going to be getting that news when you get a, a, an email alert about it from somebody else. You know, you know, this one, I'm, I'm sort of jump in, but I think that's one of the things that I have found is the biggest difference in people that are new to the journalism profession or PR profession. Um, is that Stephen and I we work together, and there's always a middle ground, just like we can find. Um, and we maintain a relationship because I know that I'm going to have to work with him tomorrow, and I'm going to see him this afternoon, right? And I will have young journalists come in, guns blazing, and I'm like, all right, guys, you know. Um, and uh, it, it's a totally different mentality. And I think once you get into the industry and you really get your feet under you um, on both sides, then it is a relationship that both of you need. And so it, uh, you end up learning to work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question. Go ahead, Christine. Will you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Christian Vila. I'm a junior journalist major at Stanford University. Um, so when you're forming like through deep sheets, as you call them, specifically if it's not necessarily for your specific concentration of a beat, how do you go about that? Do you make a list of, like, are you proactive? You make a list of, I want to connect and contact these people, or is it you meet someone and then you add them after? At least from my end, I think it's a hard thing. I would warn you already against the idea of a well-established church and state separated uh, beat system. Mm -hmm. In my experience, I, I was on a beat uh, eight years ago. I'm not on a beat anymore. <laughs> I cover everything. And uh, increasingly, that's what uh, at least small town, uh, as small town as Tuscaloosa is, that's what medium to small market journalism looks like. One or two people doing as much as they can. Uh, and so with, the, with creating a beat sheet or creating a network, there is, uh, I think I started that Google Doc when I was at the Crimson Y. So to begin with, it's like a 12-year-old I can't. Uh, but yeah, you know, in some instances, when we launched the thread, I thought, okay, well, not only do I need to know everybody in Tuscaloosa County, but Town Square's really got a nine-county West Alabama uh, coverage area. And so I, I knew I had weaknesses in my network in Greene County, in Marengo County, in Sumter County, in Hale County, in these even more rural surrounding areas, but they don't have other outlets who are working to cover the news out of Utah, Alabama, or out of uh, Pickens County. And so those people are still relying on reporters who live and work in Tuscaloosa and on the Tuscaloosa thread to tell their stories. And uh, really, when I was most proactive about the beat sheet and realizing that 
especially outside of Tuscaloosa, especially outside of this city of 100,000 people in this county of 200,000 people, there's another quarter million that really look to this region for uh, coverage of the issues that affect them of, uh, of what's coming and what's going and what's happened. And the, what I had to be most proactive was building out that broader West Alabama network. And then there's plenty of reacts. You know, people people are hired all the time. Jobs change out, which is predecessor was Alex House. Alex House just replaced the spokesperson for uh, the, the assistant director of communications at UA. Right. That was a guy named Shane Doral. Now it's Alex House. And so Alex went from the city to the chamber to the university. Mm-hmm. I've known her at all three stops, but I've got to, I've got to update that beat, Chief. I've got to go in and say, okay, I don't need to call Shane Doral anymore about issues on campus. I need to call Alex, who thankfully I've worked with for eight years already. And uh, it, it's definitely a mix. It's a mix of knowing where your weaknesses are and trying to proactively bridge that connection and, and shore up that fence. And uh, then reactively, you're going to meet people over the course of every day of work. Every day is different in journalism. Every, you are never going to have two days that look the same. And you will encounter people everywhere who have information that one day you may need. Um, and you may not call that person for five years, you know, and I, and there's a, a great guy, Dean Argo, who is at uh, Al- the, the federal ATF for alcohol, tobacco, firearms, explosives. I almost never have to call Dean, but when I have to call Dean, I'm glad I know the federal guy in charge of alcohol, tobacco, explosives, and firearms, because that's an agency that when when they're involved, they're going to have info that nobody, even locally, has. Sure. Uh, and and so yeah, I didn't know I needed Dean until one day I did, and now if I call him, he'll answer. You know, and I think once you, once you, it, it doesn't take long getting in the industry before the world gets pretty small. And you, you start to, this connection hooks you up with that connection. And then all of a sudden, like, it's like you're off and running. So mm-hmm. there's a question here that's kind of uh, this a, a good follow up to that, which is do you, uh, do you sort of set aside specific time periodically to try to grow your network or do you just kind of take those opportunities as you come? How intentional are you about trying to, to grow your network of people that you know? Um, I am really intentional. Um, before we leave, I will give all of you my cards. You know, I will shake your hand and look in the eyes, tell you my name. Um, there are chamber events that I go to specifically for networking. Um, it's it's one of my goals. Just as the person who handles communication for the city, I need to know as many people as I can, and have a good relationship with as many people as I can. And so that's what I do daily. Um, a lot of times, if the mayor goes somewhere, I go somewhere. And um, so I am constantly making an, an effort um, to go out to meet people. Um, because a lot of times, I mean, and hopefully the motivation is right, right? But like, if I, if I know you, if, if I don't know you and I don't know your problem, I can't be a part of the solution, right? But in my role in the city, if I, if, I, if I do know you and I, I get to hear your story, then I might be able to go back to City Hall and hopefully get something changed or get some wheels moving to help a situation. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that is my goal every single day. Um, I don't necessarily set aside time for it. It's just more of for me a mindset where um, I need these relationships, and um, hopefully it helps us close out along the way. So. I think the the uh, fewer your day to day responsibilities, the the bigger your team. Maybe the more time you can mm-hmm. intentionally block. Mm-hmm. Um, I find generally that if I if I make solid plans and think today is the day I'm gonna stick to them, yeah. that's when there's going yeah. to be a, a mining a, a death at a coal mine at Tuscaloosa County on top of two separate traffic fatalities on top of a robbery arrest and a big fire and I'll be running all day long from sunrise to sundown and I have not done any networking. But there are organizations everywhere that are extremely good conveners of professionals. Richard mentioned the Chamber. Uh, They have uh, morning networking. This is the Chamber of Commerce of West Alabama. Uh, There will be similar organizations everywhere you work. But the the Tuscaloosa Chamber, they have a... uh, Coffee and Cards networking event that's for early birds. It's set, you know, some god 
forsaken I don't get pre-dawn. It. <laughs> everybody, <laughs> everybody is coffee together. Not yet. <laughs> That's not for me. I am I am, I am still getting going. But hey, you know, they also have business after hours. So the right. business after hours, that's for the late night, right? Cool. You change out your mug of coffee and pre-dawn for a uh, a margarita post sunset. And then that's a, that's a, that's a, an atmosphere I thrive a little better. <laughs> they have uh, benchmarking trips every year, which are an incredible opportunity where leaders from Tuscaloosa go to similarly sized communities across the U.S. Chattanooga, Asheville, North Carolina, uh, Greenville, Greenville uh, and they will take 100 to 150 of the top leaders in Tuscaloosa. I make a point now to go on those trips with the chamber. I want to see these people in that specific environment where they're networking with one another. They're discussing the problems and issues and opportunities that the community faces. And I can be extremely deliberate at an event like that. But again, Every day is so dependent on the news of that day. Uh, yeah, I, I have a slight plan for what today will look like. I have three stories I'd like to get out to or published, and I have an event to cover at four, and this thing today at 11.30 here with you all. Um, but at any point, you know, my, my phone could make a noise that would tell me it's all out the window. It's time to throw those plans out and get to, uh, get to the new breaking news. Um, and so it's all fast-paced. It's hard to plan anything when your team is small and, and you have a, a broad coverage area. Um, but I think it like the beach, it, you can be both proactive and reactive. And whether it's a, a chamber of commerce, we're in the Rotary Room, there is a, a hearty Rotary Club in Tuscaloosa that meets, uh, they have a morning crew and, and afternoon crew. And uh, there's a Kiwanis Club, there's an Elks Lounge. Every one of these organizations, plus a, a large number of other nonprofits like the United Way, Habitat for Humanity, uh, Child Abuse Prevention Services, every one of those is made up of professionals who are doing something else, but also are involved in this nonprofit and this organization and this networking organization because three or four of them exist only to connect professionals. And so even if you feel that you are running into a wall, Nine times out of ten, there's an organization specifically designed in that area, in that city, community, town, to connect you with people who will be beneficial to you. Okay. And there may be dues to pay to you to get into that. There, there, there may be, uh, you know, a, a ten dollar uh, collection at an event you go to. But the connections that you make there, the networking build, is going to far out yeah. see, uh, far exceed whatever you might. Uh, invest in just walking into a room to meet 10 people that you may work with in the future. Uh, one of those 10 people may give you a story that's going to alter your career. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just don't know when you're going to meet them. Uh, you don't know what story you're going to do that's going to lead them back to you. You don't know uh, what is going to snap somebody and say, I know that guy, or I know the guy to reach out to about the only one, whatever it is. But if, you, if you're in front of me and you build that network, and you maintain those relationships, they will think it, and they'll reach out. You can tell stories you really did not believe you were capable of telling. Great time. On the journalistic side, and I know the people from whom you're getting these cards and contacts are not thinking this at the time, but talk about the importance of getting contact information from people while they want to give you that contact information, <laughs> yes, as opposed to when yes. they have said or done something where they really would rather you not have that information. Absolutely. That's, uh, I mean, across the board, <laughs> across the, any beat in the world is going to have bad news. And then you, you, like you say, you've got to have your foot in the door before the news is bad. Um, if, if you have worked well with the city and with the police department, uh, on all of their initiatives, on covering crime, on on getting information about uh, wanted suspects out or man hunts out or, or drives that they're doing or Halloween events, then in you know when when there is an officer involved shooting or there's a video of, of, of a bad interaction between police and uh, a citizen or someone they stop, you are going to you're going to be miles ahead if if you are already on good terms with the person. The point of contact there, and, and so it is with a. We've had a, a, a mining death in Tuscaloosa County. We've had problems at the Mercedes plant, um, and in education, and in mental hospitals, and everywhere you go, Solomon said you want to make sure that those relationships are pre-existing. 
someone who already knows you is going to be a lot more likely to answer the phone, to return your email, to agree to a meeting, to send you a picture or a statement than, hey, I'm with an outlet you may never have heard of. We've never worked before, but today on the day of your biggest crisis, I would <laughs> like your attention. I would like to become your first priority. Um, I, I, one, of the, one of the big challenges of journalism is that what is your top priority uh, about getting that news out? Maybe your sources eighth priority to talk to the media. They have, they have real issues to solve. First, other people communicate with, and even good intention sources may not be thinking, gosh, you know what I need to do is I need to call the thread and get them up on this. Uh, but if they know who you are, they know that you have good intentions, and that they can trust you, that you're not going to take an off-the-record comment and blow it up on your site and send it to 80,000 mobile devices, then when all hell is breaking loose, you have, you have upped the chances, at least, that they're going to answer your call. Does everybody do it as soon as I want them to? Absolutely not. Uh, but I've got check calls for return right now. So. But do most people, after after this long, after working this hard, and after mostly maintaining positive relationships throughout the region, yes. I don't, I don't know of anything that could happen today that I could not get information about immediately. Mm -hmm. But that's taking a long time to get to. Richard, I love your perspective on that. Would you rather have a contentious conversation with a journalist you know or a journalist you don't know? Um, I guess I've had both. Um, contentious conversation with probably oh, would I rather somebody I don't know? Yeah, you know, because <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. he never talked to me. Yeah, he might have talked to me. If Stephen and I get into it, I'm going to see him this afternoon at four, right? You know? How does that change the way you, you approach uh, that conversation? Oh, I mean, it, like, it definitely does. And, like you said, you know, um, I've got a thousand things on my list of things to do today, but there, I, I received two, two texts this morning that, hey, can you give me, you know, a soundbite on this at, at some point today? And I've got to, I've got to make that a priority to get those to those people because I'm valuing those people and they'd be good to me and I want to be good to them, right? So that kind of job. Every day when he wakes up, he goes, okay, I got three stories, right? Or, you know, um, like uh, one of the guys on the call back is Tim Reed. Okay, so like he's a um, a reporter and he's got a meeting that he comes out of at nine thirty every morning and he's got to have a story for the day and probably one for the afternoon, right? And so if I'm not helping him out, how much do you want to help me out the next time, right? Um, but you know, there's always it doesn't matter. Like Stephen said, it doesn't matter what organization that's working. Um, there's always going to be a crisis day. There's always going to be a bad day, and um, there is going to be rub between the PR person and the media at times, but um, it is learning to work together as best as possible, just knowing that I, I'm going to do my best to help you out um, and get you what you need um, and be a good person. And I hope that you return the favor. And, it, it's, and it's tough yeah, because if you if you betray that trust, you probably never be good. Yeah, I agree. And, and Richard and I are at a point in our professional relationship that yeah, he, 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 will, <laughs> he will tell me things that do not end up in the thread. And it's our understanding that they're not going to. Sure. I can get background, I can get a deeper understanding that I do not then share with however many, uh, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of people are going to read that piece when it's published. And I think, especially in, in a town uh, like this, in, in, in a state like this, in a region like this, it goes back to that idea that you're going to be working with the same people a long time. Even even Alex House, who I mentioned earlier, had Richard's job and then moved to the chamber and then moved to the university. And if I if I had uh, ruined that relationship while she was in Richard's shoes, then I would have had a closed door later in the chamber, and I would have a closed door now at the university. And so it's 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 a delicate balance. You, know, you want to get the truth. You want to report the truth. But you also have to keep that network in in a uh, uh, state of affairs that you can come back to. Because so, you may need it, you may need it a month from now. You may need it later the same afternoon. Uh, you you might have another story out of the city, sure. uh, or whatever uh, whatever beat you're covering, whatever uh, agency or or group that you're uh, covering at the time. Well, thank y'all both so much for uh, for taking the time. It's busy. Uh, we'll take a little five minute break and then we will proceed on to our next panel, which is going to be focused on mentorship. Can y'all stick around? Yeah. Thanks. 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 Thanks.
Open to you know, how much longer I so our second panel for today is entitled being a mentor and being a mentee so we've got two folks who are uh, very experienced in working with um, particularly students but also with professionals and who are going to talk to us about the mentorship mentee relationship what we can uh, look for in a good mentor, or perhaps how we can be a good mentor. Uh, so our speakers for this panel are Jesse Patterson-Jones, who's the Director of Student Media at the University of Alabama. She's a lifelong Tuscaloosa resident, right, uh, who's worked at UA in a number of communication roles since 2010. Uh, she was a student at UA, at UA, where she was the managing editor of Crimson White. And also we have with us Jay Waters, who is a senior instructor of advertising and public relations and co-advisor of the University of Alabama's Capstone Agency. Uh, Jay started teaching full-time at, at UA in 2015 uh, after spending 24 years in the advertising business. So, uh, Jay and Jesse, thank y'all so much for being here. Uh, if you wouldn't mind if each of you could just talk for a couple of minutes about uh, being a mentor and about what, uh, what that mentor-mentee relationship should be like, and then we'll open it up to the room for questions. I'll, I'll start. Uh, you know, I think this is a natural follow-along because your mentor relationships are going to come from among that pool of people that you network with, and so eventually you maybe move your relationship on a little bit more. Um, and I think that uh, and it's just kind of a follow-up on that conversation about the importance of networking. Kept that One thing I read one time was that opportunities are always attached to a person. They're always attached to a person. They just don't fall out of the sky, right? There's someone attached to them. And one of those opportunities could be a mentor relationship that, that you have. You have to establish that networking first. Um, I think one of the, and given our audience thinking from the perspective here, one of the challenges of being a mentor is, is that sometimes the people you're mentoring, you don't know what they don't know. And they don't know what they don't know, right? And so it's like, um, it's like when you come to, uh, sometimes when, uh, I get dressed in the morning, my wife says, you're going to wear that, right? You know, it's not, it's not like she, um, she knows ahead of time. And so that's for a lot of times for mentor-mentee relationships, you don't know the questions that you need to answer and help people answer for them. Um, and so that's why you need to have a lot of conversation and, and, and what you might think are mundane conversations to let them know kind of what you're thinking and where you're going, because it's, it's the little things oftentimes that are, are big helps. Um, we had an assignment in our class the other day. Um, I, I teach a class in agency management. And one of the, the assignment was um, the agency that we're studying, one of their traditions was is that when a new employee came on board, they would write uh, an email to the entire staff introducing themselves, right? And so uh, I had everybody write their emails. And so as you read those emails, you know, I can, I can give them some pointers, but until you read those emails, you say, oh, no, you really shouldn't say that, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the kind of little subtle things that is, it seems like an inconsequential thing, writing an email to introduce yourself, but there are little things that could get you off on the wrong foot that a mentor could help, help steer you away from that. But they don't know it in advance. You know, without you having that relationship. So that's one of the things that is in terms of making sure you have that you don't self censor, I guess, in some respects, some of the parts of the relationship so that they can answer the questions that you don't need, that you don't know need to be answered. You know, I was coming here and I was trying to think about who my mentors were because I think they're such a formal title. You don't just walk up to someone quickly and be like, will you be my mentor? We don't have that conversation too often now. It's something that you seem to fall into more. And for me, there were three over my college years. Um, they were all a function of a position I got or something I was doing. It, it, they all happened naturally. One was uh, my college advisor. He was the advisor to the campus newspaper. Um, I have his job today. It is, I'm 38. I've known him since I was 19 and I called him last week for advice. They, all three of them are relationships that stayed with me. I still talk to them all probably at least two or three times a year. And I don't think 
when you're younger, you expect that. You don't really know that they might run the course of your entire career. And that's where I've really seen just so much value as a mentee, but I had no idea that we were gonna go down that path. Um, when I was thinking about things I've run into with students, I think it does go off of what you were saying. Always make sure you're saying what you know, but what you can do if you're trying to especially get a job or you know get an internship. But it always helps me to hear what you want to learn how to do that you're open about not knowing how to do. Because it helps someone make that decision of, I have enough time to invest, I, I can do this. Or if I'm expecting someone to come in and design all my stuff and that's not my skill set, I, I can't, this isn't the best fit, but I'd rather know that now and point you in the right direction than both of us find out two or three months in and it, it doesn't work. That's that's more of a waste because you're not growing in the way you want to. So that was kind of my, my initial thought is I'd rather know what you don't know that you want to learn. Uh, anybody have any questions? I'll start us rolling with one. Okay. Um, there are a few of us uh, a little more gray haired in the room. What do you think goes into being a good mentor? You know, y'all have both of you have worked with students for a long time. What what makes what do good mentors do? Um, they listen, I think, first off. Um, and I think they're honest, you know, and, and have the um, and that, that have the trust that they can you can be honest with the person you're talking to. I mean, because that even be for students. When I was talking, you know, I, I had younger people when working for me at the agency and things like that. And and um, you know, sometimes, especially if you're in, a, in in the same office, sometimes you have to you have to be honest and say, well, that didn't go well, right? And here's why I think it didn't go well. Um, and so being open to that, but being honest, and you, you're not mentor isn't equivalent to cheerleader. It is. I mean, you, you, there's a part of the job that's that, but it's, and, it, and it's not apparent either. But it's but it is it is this sense of being honest and saying. Here's how you can be the best version of yourself. You know, I, used, uh, I worked with the, I worked with someone who um, uh, who was an account supervisor. And she had a lot of younger people that she had to mentor. And so a lot of times the conversation was, I don't think you picked the right career for yourself, <laughs> right? You know, that being honest, but 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 she's wanting the best for them. She's wanting the best for them, and just their skill set was not what we needed. The vision, and that person ended up being a teacher, right? It's completely different place. But because, you know, if you're, if you're trying to be a cheerleader, then you might keep encouraging, hey, I think you can be better, rather than be honest and say, really, I don't think this is what you need to be doing. And so you want the best for people and you want to be honest about that. So I think my answer is different if you're mentoring a student versus a young professional. I think, and I don't know if this is what you're seeing, I am seeing that students need a lot more on the front end. It's not, um, maybe we're having to cover more of the basics than I would expect. And I think that is probably a post-pandemic issue. Um, there are a few years where everyone didn't get the same experiences and we're, we're still seeing some of those students, um, especially just with everything from, I think, confidence levels to how to handle in-person interaction or even email etiquette sometimes. Um, I think we're spending a little more time with that starting point. Um, and then with young professionals, I, I think it is setting that expectation early and often. I, we, we've had some people come into our office. We don't see a lot of turnover, but in my old job, I had more communications professionals come and go. And I think, it was so important to show the atmosphere that they were walking into and just say, it is X, Y, and Z. That's, that's the expectation. But then after that, like, let's have a conversation a few weeks. What isn't what you expect? What, what, are you, what are you running into? And I think the evolution of those professional relationships for mentoring are the most helpful because it, you both get the most out of it if you 
to make it a safe place to actually talk through issues. Mm -hmm. Jay, I'd love your perspective on the things that Jesse brought up, which is that maybe mentorship and a student professor relationship is different from mentorship and a you know in a professional environment. Is that your experience? I, I think I think it's true. I, I'm, I'm thinking back. I mean, there are things that I think you have duty and opportunity to say to students that you wouldn't train on professional because it's like, well, they should know that, right? You know, um, um, but um, but it is true that there are a lot of a lot of times I think there's a perception that the mentor is going to give you these higher level kinds of things. As a student, when in fact there's some pretty basic things that they think that a mentor should provide to you or sees that you need that may be frustrating to the mentee. So, well, that seems pretty basic and fundamental, but yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's fundamental, right? And so you need that. So I think that's I think there is a difference there that um, that you have to accommodate. You know, and again, it goes back to you don't really understand what they don't know until you, you find out. That <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll tell a story here. Sure. Um, I had uh, I was interviewing someone for a job. I was desperate to hire someone. Flew them in from Chicago, um, and uh, I told someone as I was leaving that I was going to take them to dinner that night. I said, unless they have two heads, I'm going to hire them. Right. And so um, they came, and, and they were kind of they were starting out to throw. They're like 28, 29. Um, we go out to dinner. I pick her up at the airport. Go out to dinner with the talk, and she has the most atrocious table manners I have ever seen in my life. I'm going like, I cannot take. So I get to the office the next day and said, she has two heads, right? <laughs> but we, but I hired her anyway. I'm desperate. I said, I can fix her. I can fix her. And, that, and so one of the ways we tried to do that was, is that uh, we said, well, I need to fix this whole dinner with eating thing. You think it's pretty basic? So we ended up. I can't just single her out. So we took like twelve of us. To an etiquette class at the club, you know, hoping to do that, but that was just one of the problems, you know. So, um, you know, sometimes you just can't fix people, right? But, but that's a kind of a basic thing that you expect someone to have, and they, they didn't have that skill, right? And, and, and regardless of what the other work was, I can't take you out. I can't trust you. I can't tell you if you can't do basic those basic skills. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what you didn't know until I knew, until I found out. So, you talked about. Fixing the person. Many marriage counselors have talked about. That's exactly right. That's okay, that's fine. I'll, okay, that's okay. I'll fix him or I'll fix her. You can't fix. You can't fix grownups. Right. This work. So, is is that the impossible dream for a mentor <laughs> to say, okay, I can fix this person? I was desperate. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably how some of those marriages happen to the Zenith people, right? Um, um, but I was desperate, so I said, I'm, you know, and I said, I'm going to make an investment in this person and try to, you know, and do that. But you're right, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And, and I, and that, that person eventually went away, left the industry, went to something else. And so, you know, it eventually got up. But, you know, that was a case where I should have known, but circumstances said, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> You know, if I if I had more choices, I wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be bother. When you t when we talk about that preparedness, uh, how easy let's say for students for someone who is in school and their aim is to get ready for the real world, how difficult is it, or how talk to me about molding somebody so that they are ready to take off. I think most of it depends on their attitude and their work ethic. If you have those two things, the rest of it seems to take care of itself. But if you're lacking in those two things, I don't know if anything I can do can get you there. If, if someone is eager and wants to sit down, it doesn't matter how many times we have to run through it. We have a newsletter that goes out three days a week. There was a typo in it yesterday. That's okay. But walking them through their process to, to teach them how to catch things themselves, I think 
we can get there if you if you are willing to work on it. I think when we find trouble is when there isn't a level of care or determination to actually do the work. You may say you want to, but do you really want to? And I think that's, you can't mold them out of that case. Anything else, we can get there. I think that you talk about being eager, but eager, eager in a direction way that is I'm eager to get better. I'm eager to find out what I don't know. I'm eager to 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 develop good habits. Um, I think I think that's eagerness as opposed to I'm eager to get a job or I'm eager to, you know, and, and, and so having a sense of um, curiosity and a little bit of humility about yourself, I think goes a, a long way. Coachability. Uh, yes. Acknowledging that you that you truly don't know it all, and I need you to guide me. Mm -hmm. The students who don't get better and that I worry about are ones who think they know it all. Okay, go ahead. This is kind of using a sports analogy. I had, I had an experience. I used to coach travel softball, and then um, and so I, I coached a group that was like from. 12 you to 16, 18 you. And I had a group one time that was 16 you, 16 year old, and, they, and I had like 10 girls on the team, five were exceptional, really good for their age and all that kind of stuff. Five were less talented. Um, and the five that were really good, they went off and joined some teams where they weren't practiced, they didn't have the practice or they, they didn't, they weren't pushed. And by the time they got to high school, they were done. They had they had not they quit playing softball altogether because they had never they had been told then that they were good enough and they never tried to improve. The five that weren't as good at that point and it continued on and kept playing and kept practicing ended up being really good at the end because they had the attitude of I need to get better. And sometimes when you're good, you know, at some level you think I'm good enough for all levels. And really you just have to keep working, right? You have to keep working and uh, I think that holds true for students. To your point, you've got to be willing to be coached. And, what, and, and, and that starts with willing to know that I can be better at this, whatever it is. Talk about the difference or the balance between praise and plotting. If I'm trying to get you to do something, it will be crying. If I just want to celebrate you, you're going to hear my praise. Like, it's not this. And, and I try to separate the two. I think that's the other point. It's not, great job, now go do this. I, I want to separate them because otherwise I don't think either one really sticks. You, you don't think, oh, I really did a good job. You used to, I don't this guy. I'm, I can be overly critical and I know that. So I want to just not add the next thing. Like, let's tackle one thing at a time. If we really just want to celebrate something, let's do that. Or if we're trying to get somewhere, let's do that and then celebrate it. I think, I think if you, and again, go back to sports, I used to, and I think lots of coaches have said this, if I'm not getting after you and prodding you, then I've, in a way, given up on you. If I'm only praising you, in a way. And so, um, and so, um, my, it's easier to praise the prod, and you're not going to make that investment in time as a mentor, uh, mentor to prod people if you don't feel the investment's going to pay off. And says, so, oh, that was good. And then that's the end of it, right? As opposed to someone you think they can get better and wants to get better, and say, okay, let me tell you how you can get better at that. So prodding, prodding, prodding takes more of an investment than a praise from a mentor, and you don't get that investment if you're not proving that you're going to just go pay off. Go ahead, McKenzie. Will you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Mackenzie Sims. I'm a history student at Sanford University. I'm under the great Dr. Carey here. Um, so in our last session, we talked a bit about intentionality when it comes to networking. Um, and I know being very intentional, being very eager can be a good thing. But again, like you said, you can't just walk up to someone and be like, will you be my mentor? So can you maybe like give some advice for how to organically develop relationships with people that you want to mentor you? I think for me, it's finding a connection point. One of our Alice students last week, I have known her for two years, 
and I have let her babysit my son. Like I trusted her with my four year old. I think she'd be a great kid. But we had never just really gotten into career paths and we're standing there at a big event. There were 50 people there in our office. And she said something that caught my attention after she heard that I'm working on my doctorate. She said, I want to be a, like, I want to be on a campus forever. Like, I think it'd be so cool to work here. And I'm like, you know, there are jobs that do that. It's part of what I get to do in student affairs and student life. And, you know, we set up time to talk because she realized that I have additional information outside of just my day-to-day -day job, making sure they have what they need and, and are good to go. Like, we can actually talk through career paths in higher education because it's not just the professors she sees. There's a whole other side that she doesn't know about. And it's just, to me, it was finding that connection point. I never would have walked up and said, oh, hey, let's, like, let's really connect. She cares about something that I'm passionate about and want to bring more students into our profession. Um, and so it was just that one comment about a, a mutual, mutual love of higher education. The silliest, smallest thing, if you both care about it, it provides a really great entryway to, to get into a whole range of topics. For me, I think the times that I tell people, it's always started with a question, instead of that, who you be my mentor, it's just like, it's more of you know, a simpler question. What do you think about this opportunity? Or what do you, um, you know, I've had um, students who said, I, I'm, I'm looking at two different options. What do you what do you think about these two? And having a conversation about that and continuing the conversation. I still have students that will, you know, have graduated two or three years and I don't hear from them for two or three years, but then they say, hey, I, can I talk to you about this new opportunity I have? And because we've had a conversation, I kind of I kind of up the speed with them a little bit. I've had them in a couple of classes. And so, of course, they've obviously grown since I've talked to them a little bit. But um, but they, it always starts with a question. It's not, uh, and we've kind of fallen into that relationship, right? And um, what do you think about this? Or I'm thinking about doing this. Do you think this would be a good thing for me to do? Or something like that. But you, again, it has to start with, you know, some initial conversations. Um, and then, you know, and then you can kind of judge, you know, kind of what the interest is and then the okay, what you think the quality of the information you're getting, right? Um, that because uh, if, if you get, if you feel like you're getting good feedback, then you know ask more questions. Right? I think I think it starts with a question. Uh, you know, a specific question that you think that person can answer, and they know you well enough to give you an answer about it. Right. I mean, if I add something to that, I'm gonna turn around and talk to the people I need to talk to. I think it's easy for people like y'all to think that. Extracurricular mentorship is a burden on people that that you're approaching about these things. It is not. You know, people like I assume this is true of y'all. You know, I get a lot of relationships that I have, and so I hope that's something that you can remember. Is that you know, there have been times in my life when I saw, particularly as I was entering this career that I'm in right now, where I kind of felt like asking someone to mentor me through things was a burden on that thing, and I didn't want to trouble someone who I respected. That's not the way good mentors will approach this relationship. So don't be afraid no. to, to foster those relationships because it's not a burden. So I'm not on this panel, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that you know, yeah, I run student media, but some of that is marketing or opportunities and you know, our six media outlets to current students and everything from getting them to participate in them to just knowing that they're there and engaging with them as a reader or a follower. And I'm not as young as I once was. I don't always know what's cool. And so being able to say, hey, you have some end of your money. These are the promo items I'm looking at. What is going to be a hit? Like, it, it goes both ways. So Y'all have so much to offer us as well. We're, we're looking to claim you. <laughs> we, are. we are looking to claim you and, and, and your success is part of our success. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so so we want you to be successful. And uh, uh, that, that's why um, we're interested in investing in the, in the relationship. I have just a question sort of on the flip side of you guys are talking about how like 
uh, the coachability of a mentee and how that is something we want them to develop. Um, on the flip side of like someone asking not enough questions and not caring enough, what if you have a mentee who's a, a little, I don't want to say like overly dependent or asking questions, but um, in the past I've had some experiences where an internship, you know, I was really curious and wanted to ask lots of questions to my supervisor, and it realized that maybe the end of the internship um, that came across as to her, maybe like that I wasn't problem solving enough or something, mm -hmm. but in fact, I was just really wanting to just know more. And so maybe I came across it differently. So I didn't know if there were any tips or things you had in mind for um, asking the right amount of questions, not be too dependent, but not. Like not asking anything. I don't know if that makes sense. I think it depends on the questions, right? Because I think um, there have been times when people have asked me questions which I feel are lack of effort questions, right? That okay, you're wanting a shortcut uh, to some, you know, do something that you could have figured out yourself. And so that yes, those can be deflating in a way. Um, I think I think. If you're asking a lot of questions, they should be looking ahead or putting two and two together and figuring out. I think I think those are the kinds of questions that no one minds answering, right? Oh, okay. This is looking ahead. This is not the obvious thing. And so you, you do have to be thoughtful about making sure that have you really thought about this a little bit? Um, because we're, I don't think we're in the business of helping you get answers as much as helping you think about options right so so if, you, if it's a question where i simply i want to answer this question i think that's less than oh let me give you an opinion about a couple of different options that maybe are out of your view like that you couldn't say at this point so i think for me the first thing i wonder is if it was just the wrong time sometimes the things that are in front of me in the moment have to get done. I've even had to say it to obviously professional staff members. And it, I hate to say it, but it's like, it's budget season. I, I can't today. If this is not, something is on fire, can we please hold it till tomorrow? I've had to learn to be better about saying that because my door is always open. I don't go lock myself in office and we're all pretty close together. But Paying attention to that, maybe asking for a specific time frame, and then asking for feedback on your questions after you've had a conversation. I have a really great supervisor right now, and I appreciate that so much. But I was trying to figure out if I was picking up the phone at the right times. Not, you know, we meet every two weeks. That's it. That's Pretty typical for when I see you see your staff every week to two weeks for just routine meetings. And I couldn't figure out, we had probably four major things. I had to pick up the phone right then and get her out of something. And that's a pretty high level for me. And my question to her was, am I calling at the right time? Is there anything I should have held to our next meeting? Or is there anything you just didn't think was that urgent. I just want to make sure we're on the same page because we're in another school year. There's always going to be something going wrong. And I just, I wanted to double check my own thought process on that. And she just looked at me and she's like, I'm hearing from you. Like, I'm not hearing from you too little, but in terms of like the, she's like, no, like those were all things that could have hit you know, news breaking or caught our vice president off guard, which is never something you want when you, when you don't want your boss to be caught off guard by someone outside of your area. Um, but asking that question gave me a lot more confidence to know, okay, I'm making the right calls right now. Even a question like that, like, I know I've had these questions. Can you tell me, like, was there anything I should have been able to figure out? On my own, help me help me get better at this. I want to say I didn't have a student asking one time. They asked me a bunch of questions. Said, "Well, do you mind?" I said, "I said, and I do remember saying, I think these were questions that you could have figured out with a little bit of effort." 
Um, so, so that was a, and, and then she came back with, you know, and she took that to heart and she was very co coachable and, and came back with better questions later on. So, um, so that is, I think that is a very good uh, strategy too, because I, I knew those two that did it that one time. Well, thank you all very much. So the last thing on our agenda, <laughs> is that time? Is it like? The last thing on our agenda is a little networking practice. And so there are, uh, here in the room, perfectly divisible by three number, which is fantastic. Only your name tag. If you look at the bottom, there's a little script with a color. Stephen, yours is green. Thanks. All the panelists have green strips. <laughs> so here's what I'd like to do. Stephen's in a spot. Jesse's in a spot. And Jay's in a spot in the back. I would like everybody to go find somebody whose name tag strip is a different color than yours. So Stephen needs a red and yellow. Jesse needs a red and yellow. And Jay needs a red and yellow. So you're going to go, and the three of you are just going to chat and get to know each other. I want you to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about what you do, and then talk a little bit about something, a way that you would like to grow professionally. Uh, these conversations are going to last for six minutes, and then I'm going to signal you to rotate. And we'll, some of you have perhaps have heard of speed dating. This is like speed network. So every six minutes, the groups will change, and we'll do the same thing. We'll introduce ourselves. We'll talk a little bit about what we do. And we'll talk a little bit our, about our professional goals, uh, not necessarily to some specific end, although if you would like to bring that up, that's okay, but just to sort of meet people and to get comfortable, make some new connections and to get comfortable doing this. So I will give you a warning at uh, three minutes. That's sort of the halfway point of your six-minute uh, six session. And then I'll give you another warning at 30 seconds, and then we'll rotate. So we need a red tag and a yellow tag over here, a red and yellow there, and a red and a yellow there. If you want to turn the chairs around and sit, that would be fine. Follow me you're in this game too. You have a red stack. Red stack. All right. Okay, so we can stream this. Really grateful for your expertise. Um, if you'd like to learn more about AMD, again, there's the uh, QR code back here on the table. Um, entries for the AMD Annual Communication Awards will be opening soon. There are, I know, at least one, two, three, four AMD award winners in the room. Uh, we have great awards and we have great student categories. We've had a lot of, we've had UA students be very successful in this competition in the past. So uh, please look for information about that. Uh, again, if you'd like to learn more, um, please let us scan the QR code. Thank you all for being here and uh, safe travels. And we usually end meetings in Tuscaloosa by saying roll tide. Too, well, <laughs>